Hello, I've got Jen Hatfield here to discuss a story she wrote about six-year pro Erica McCall and why her story matters when we talk about the future of the WNBA and its growth. The Locked On Women's Basketball Podcast starts now. You are Locked On Women's Basketball. Your daily podcast on women's basketball. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. All right. Hello and welcome. You are locked on to women's basketball. And I'm Jackie Powell. I'm one of your Friday hosts this fall. I cover the New York Liberty here at The Next. I also help with our social media and our social media strategy. And I've covered women's basketball also nationally at Bleacher Report, Sports Illustrated, W Slam, and many other places. And first, we wanted to thank you for making Locked On Women's Basketball your first listen every day. And remember, we are free and available on all platforms, including YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and many more. And so today's episode is brought to you by Bet Online. Bet Online has you covered this season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. Bet Online, where the game starts. So, on today's show, we're going to chat here with Jen about her story that she wrote about Erica McCall. And it was an ad- abnormal story for, or actually rather, an abnormal season or off season or summer. I'm having trouble finding the word. It was an abnormal summer for Erica McCall. And Jen's going to tell us why. Then we're going to talk about why Erica's story matters and what it tells us about the league. And then we're going to finish explaining some of the issues that we've learned about the WNBA and and what the WNBA faces because of what Erica has to deal with. So let's dive right in. So, Jen, hello. Thank you for being here. My first question for you is, what led you to pursue this story about six-year pro Erica McCall? Yeah, thanks for having me, Jackie. I'm really excited to talk about this story some more. I really enjoyed um, learning about what she went through this summer and, and excited to share it more widely. Uh, So Erica McCall most recently played for the Washington Mystics. Uh, I am the beat reporter for the Mystics. So uh, technically, I suppose she's still on my beat, um, or at least there's not a clear conflict with another beat reporter. So uh, I kind of just said mine. Um, (laughs) And I first learned about what she was going through this summer, actually on her podcast, Bird's Eye View, um, which is a great listen if you aren't familiar with it. Um, she talks to WNBA players, agents, coaches, just about their experience playing overseas and professionally as a whole. And so I was listening to her podcast this summer, and over the course of many episodes, she um, you know, gave listeners a look at, at how things were going for her. I knew she had been uh, cut due to injury uh, in training camp for, for the Mystics this season, but then you know, she hadn't signed on with another team. And so when that happens to a player, they kind of they kind of go dark a lot of the times. We don't really know what they're up to. And so I got a little glimpse of what she was doing based on kind of the hints she dropped or what she told us about her life um, on that podcast while she was talking to other guests. So that was kind of enough to pique my interest um, in. And, and the way that I was thinking about it is, you know, what does a WNBA player do in a summer without the WNBA? You know, you can you can make all sorts of comparisons in different fields, you know, like what what does an accountant do if, if there's no tax season anymore? Like the, their whole universe just isn't there suddenly. And uh, we'll talk about this later, but there's not a whole lot of support for players in that boat in the WNBA. So I was really curious how she navigated that. So I, I reached out to her agent, Mike Count, 
uh, he put me in touch with her and, and it kind of took off from there. Yeah, I mean, I loved, well, something that you do in all of your stories, Jen, is you make sure that you talk to everyone you can and you make sure that you bring in all of the characters that are in your story to speak. And so you should read this story at thenexthoops.com, obviously. But Jen not only spoke to Erica McCall herself, she spoke to her agent, Mike Count, but she also spoke to Sydney Weiss, who was someone who helped her get through the, the mental hurdles that came with this off season. And so a, a question I also have for you, Jen, is what did you, I guess, find that was surprising about writing this story? I think there were a lot of things that surprised me. Um, but if we stick with the Sydney Weiss part, I think an angle that I didn't expect. So, so Sydney was the one who kind of uh, jump-started Erica's training plan this summer. Uh, Erica was at home in Bakersfield, California, kind of floundering through no fault of her own, just didn't have a ton of resources or supports there. Um, and she ended up talking to Sydney, who is from the Phoenix area, and was she tore her ACL, so she was rehabbing as well um, in the Phoenix area. And there just happens to be a lot more support and, and a lot of different things that a that an injured athlete needs to recover kind of all in the same place. And there were several professional players in the area kind of taking advantage of those things. And so there was kind of a makeshift community. And so Sydney said, Erica, why don't you come down, see if you like my physical therapist better than what you're getting there. Like, just come stay with me for a week, see if you like it. If you don't, no problem, like go home. But I, I, think, I think you're gonna like this. And so Erica came down for a week, ended up staying two months. <laughs> um, and, and that was kind of how, how Sydney got involved. Um, but what surprised me was, you know, when, when I first reached out to Erica, I, I knew nothing of, of Sydney's involvement. And so that in itself was surprising, but, but really the whole angle of how they kind of pulled each other through the summer at times. Uh, Sydney talked to me about how uh, mentally it was so nice to have someone there who understood the shorthand of being a professional athlete. Like, she has family in the area and she could call her mom and say, you know, I had a really hard day at rehab today. And her mom would get it from like a familial instinctive perspective. But Erica's the one who knows that, you know, they both have knee injuries to boot, like very different knee injuries, but still like they, they know what it's like to wake up in the morning and your knee hurts because you did a lot of physical therapy or they know what it is when you say a complicated name of like a rehab a drill or, or stretching or, you know, they know what all those things are called. They know what it feels like. They know the uncertainty of, of getting cut and just wondering if you'll get back to the WNBA because that is a really hard thing. And that was something I touched on when I talked to Erica's agent. So I think that was really a, a like a beautiful side element. I don't want to say a side element, but, you know, a, a contributing, uh, you know, kind of a parallel, a parallel story to the main story that I was trying to tell um, was just that like beautiful bond between them um, that, that, that deepened, you know, they'd played together, they'd played against each other, like they knew each other well, but they really bonded on a, on a different level this summer. You know what I also loved about this story? I loved that you had in the beginning, you had Erica talking about how painful it was to potentially go to a WNBA uh, game. And this was sort of in the beginning of that journey when she was in California. A friend was like, oh, let's go to the Sparks game. And she didn't want to. And she didn't want to have to face those emotions and, and face the potential depressive feelings of, of feeling excluded. Um, and then you were able to show at the end when she really found her community with Sydney Weiss and then even hanging out with Megan Gustafson and, and Pancake, the, the Corgi, she was able uh, to, okay. yes, she was able to feel at one with and, and not feel insecure by going to WNBA games and showing up for people. I think that's just a beautiful metaphor for dealing with a hard time in general, you start feeling a lot of shame and pain. And then the people who help you and bring you along the way, 
you then go back to that same situation in a different location. It was in Phoenix this time rather than L.A. And then you see that Erica's outlook on the situation has completely changed. And so, I mean, the way you write your stories is always with so much attention. Those details in particular, I think, are probably my favorite parts of the story. And thank you. I really, I really love that part too. I thought it, I thought it showed her progress better than I could tell it, honestly. So uh, I, I really enjoyed. It. And then seeing her, you know, in the playoffs, she's. Uh, many of you might have seen on Twitter how how uh, active of a supporter she was of her sister, Delana Bonner, and was like fully leaned in on that. And I did touch on that a little bit in the story, but just like that's the like visceral, like, you know, she's she's doing OK. Oh, yeah. And um, I mean, give yourself more credit than that. It is it is up to the journalist. It is up to the writer to choose which moments you put in different places. So, you know, you could have, you didn't have to include those moments, but you did. Um, So now coming up, we are going to discuss why Erica McCall's story matters. But first, Let's talk a little bit about bet online. So I'm not really into sports betting, but here's the deal. I see how important it is when you look at a sport and its growth and how fans connect to it and how fans become more and more engaged. And I think it's a tool that I believe will fuel women's basketball in the years to come. But anyway, let's talk about betonline.net, which is your number number one source for football betting info this fall. Find all the latest player developments, team matchups, news, podcasts, and in-depth articles and analysis on every team you can find. And as always, BetOnline remains your continued source for all your sports wagering information with live betting and up-to-the-minute scores for every sport out there. It's the fastest and easiest way to check on your favorite games, Event and events, including the Major League Baseball playoffs, MMA, boxing, golf, and hopefully soon women's college basketball, um, head to betonline.net or use your mobile device to learn more. Bet online where the game starts. All right. Well, thank you for making Locked On Women's Basketball your first listen today. And Also, now make your second listen, Game to Game NBA. Every moment, every top performance, every result, Locked On Game to Game covers every game from across the NBA with local analysis that only Locked On can deliver. Follow Game to Game on Locked On NBA, available on the Odyssey app, YouTube, and wherever you get your podcasts. All right, Jen, let's get back to Erica McCall. And I, I want to start with the question I posed earlier. Why does her story matter? I think it matters beyond her for a lot of reasons. Uh, one thing that she talked to me about and has kind of reacted to uh, after the story came out in a positive way is the challenges for WNBA players of not feeling guilty when they rest, being able to take time off, recover from an injury. So I think that's like one piece of it. Another piece of it is kind of what I was talking about earlier about just the lack of infrastructure to support players who get injured or get cut. They have to find everything on their own. Um, Health insurance ends the day they get cut. Uh, Erica McCall had to wait a month to, to have health insurance kick in so she could have MRIs on her knees. I'm sorry, that's ridiculous. Like, not trying to make a political statement or anything, but like, that's ridiculous. That's insane. Um, we, we, sh- we should have a better system uh, for that. Um, she had to find her own gym space. She had to find her own physical therapist. She had to find her own strength and conditioning coach. She had to find everything from scratch and build her own support system all while she's dealing with the, uh, you know, kind of emotional challenges of being waived and also signing overseas and having all these things going on and, and not knowing exactly what her future holds. So, so there's that. Um, 
there's, there's all sorts of ways. Yeah. So hold on to those because I do want to talk about this one. So I actually listened to an episode of Bird's Eye View a few weeks ago. I listened to the one with Carly Samuelson. And I think that was the one that was one of the episodes that I think sparked your interest in this story. And to speak from personal experience, I mean, Erica and I are the same age. We're both 26. And so we've reached that golden age where we can't depend on our parents' health insurance. And so I'm listening to this episode and she goes into it. She's like, oh, yeah, I had to get on Cobra. It was terrible. And I'm thinking, I'm thinking, Erica wait, why did you have to go on COBRA? Maybe there was a, a plan through Obamacare that she could have gotten. But anyway, I think why this story matters is it's relatable. There are so many young people out there that are navigating issues with health insurance. And it's, as you said, it's absolutely wild that a WNBA player or someone who is one of the better basketball players in this world is completely alone and in the dark and they have nothing. Especially so, when she's already injured. Yes. So, I mean, there's, it, it, it's kind of weird the way that the CBA deals with injuries. It, it, you have different protections as far as what your team will provide in terms of like health insurance and things like that, depending on where the injury is suffered, like whether you're playing with the WNBA team at the time, it, it, it's kind of a, like a roll of the dice because, you know, a player can get injured every time they step on the court. And it's like, whether, you know, you tear your ACL in your last overseas game or your first training camp practice, like different, those can be, you know, days apart. Those could be like one day apart. If you're one of the players who, who literally has no break, and, and what you can get from your WNBA team can vary tremendously. So it's just, I mean, it, it would seem like common sense that if a player is cut because she is injured, she should be able to keep health insurance for some period of time. Because, I mean, Erica seems to have recovered fine, um, but like a month where she doesn't know what's going on with her knee, that could be a huge deal in terms of her recovery. And she was kind of guessing at what workouts she could do in the meantime, she was asking her overseas strength and conditioning coach for uh, workouts that wouldn't hurt her knee too much while she figured out what was going on. And like, that's kind of a, you know, like, what do you even give somebody when you don't know what their limitations are? So I just thought, I, yeah, I agree with you. I thought that was ridiculous. I did listen to that episode and that was, that was definitely um, one of the ones where she got, she opened up uh, more about what she was going through. Yeah, I mean, I, I've heard that COBRA is so much more expensive than a plan on Obamacare. But anyway, let's not get into talking too in-depth about health insurance. But locked on health insurance. Locked on health are. insurance. I happen to believe also that her story matters because it shines a light on the plight of mid or middle tier players. And so I'm not sure if this was something that was on your mind as well, but explain to our listeners what I mean by middle tier players. Yeah. So you're talking about the players who aren't the superstars, but have aged out of their rookie contracts, which are cheaper than the veteran minimum salaries in the WNBA. Um, and so what can happen oftentimes is that when general WNBA general managers are making their final roster decisions, um, they effectively run out of room uh, for mid-career players because they can only afford to pay the, a couple rookie salaries as opposed to a couple veteran minimums. The difference is about twelve or 13000 each, I believe. Um, I don't have the exact numbers in front of me. But so these, these mid-career players get squeezed out of the league. They're, they don't command the maximum salary, but they're not cheap enough to latch on when they may even be better than the rookie player that they're competing with, but the math doesn't add up. So as much as the team might want them, they, they don't have much recourse unless they, you know, cut a player that they think is better than a mid-career veteran, which they're not going to do. So it, it's a really tight market for these, for this group of players 
Um, and it, it's unfortunate because, you know, I'm not sure it was necessarily intended in, in the CBA. They're kind of a, a like a, a casualty of, of how the salary cap negotiations worked out. And then there's prioritization on top of that, which we can get into as well. Well, so actually, let's get into prioritization, because what you were mentioning before about the casualty from the CBA, we're going to get into that a little bit more in our third segment when we talk about potential solutions. So let's talk about prioritization. I mean, when I was looking at your story, Erica was a little, I don't want to say nonchalant, but she sort of said, listen, like, I've achieved my goal to play in the WNBA. If I can't come back because of prioritization, you know, that's okay. But is that really what the WNBA should be aiming toward? Uh, Again, another way in which these middle tier players are not playing in the league. I mean, before I turn it over to you to provide your thoughts, Jen, at the WNBA finals, It was Becky Hammond who said, listen, all great teams have their role players who do very important things on teams. A lot of role players are those middle tier players, those players that are maturing out of their rookie contracts and have maybe not the skill set of a superstar like a Asia Wilson, Brianna Stewart or John Cole Jones, but have skills to lend to teams. Yeah, so so just to, for for folks who don't know what prioritization is, I'm going to try to explain this in like one sentence. It gets really wonky really fast, but uh, starting next year, uh, players will get fined if they are late to training camp and they will be suspended for the entire year if they miss the start of the regular season. Um, but there is an exception for uh, players in the first two year in their first two years of WNBA experience. In 2024, uh, those players with more than two years of experience will all be suspended if they miss the first day of training camp. It's essentially there's there's some like more complicated uh, language in there, but that's what it, it boils down to. So that's prioritization. That was an open question I had when I talked to Erica because the Spanish league, which is uh, where she's playing now, they tend to run a little bit later than a lot of other leagues. And so I was wondering, you know, with her and her agent, when are you thinking you're going to get back? Because um, although it is tough for those mid-career players to to come, come back to the WNBA to stick, um, I do expect her to get a training camp contract at least and have a chance to battle. But if prioritization knocks her out before then, then it's kind of moot. Um, so that was definitely a topic that was on my mind. I think the um, close to nonchalance that you uh, perceived is uh, the result is the end result of a long process of acceptance from her. She had a lot to think about um, in terms of that. And, um, you know, she's she's expected to be okay in terms of timing. She may miss a couple days of training camp. But again, um, for 2023, she would just pay a fine for that and still be able to to compete and her agent doesn't expect that to affect the quality or quantity of offers she gets from WNBA teams. Um, so they think she'll be fine for now, but um, her agent is uh, pretty hot about prioritization roles in general, thinks it's thinks they're really uh, not great for the league. And we can get into, get into that a little bit more, but, you know, for Erica, it's, uh, she makes the majority of her income overseas. She's really valued overseas. She has a great contract over there right now. She's playing a ton of minutes. She gets to work on her game over there a lot more than in the WNBA where seasons are so short. And uh, a lot of times there's not a ton of practices um, or, you know, just time for, for players to develop. Um, she, she generally enjoys her time overseas. She was elated to get to play in the EuroLeague, which is the top league in Europe. Um, a really high level of competition. Um, and so she said, look, like I, I needed to do this. And it wasn't a question in my mind. Like when that offer came in, I signed it so fast. Um, and so she's like made her peace with like, assuming these prioritization rules stay as they are, she might have to pick and choose between the WNBA and overseas. You know, maybe she could do like half season contracts overseas and still kind of do both. But 
she's like, look, I, I achieved a lot in the WNBA and if they're going to force me out, well, I still got to make my money. And I, I did a lot of great things. And so I'm comfortable with that is, is kind of um, how she's thinking about it right now. The language you used, quote, force me out. You'd think that sounds so counterintuitive to everything that we know about the W right now. It's all about that exponential growth. It's all we're always talking about expansion. We're talking about how viewership is up. We're talking about how attendance is back on the up and up following COVID. And so to try to exclude or box out a a type of player, it, it just sounds so backward to me. Although I understand why prioritization became a thing. I get it. I do. But yeah. was now really the time for it? The thing, so so for, for folks who don't know, prioritization was a priority of the WNBA owners because they are tired of players being late and want them to focus on the WNBA, which makes sense in a vacuum, right? Um, I think the unfortunate thing is um, you know, and they and they excluded the uh, least experienced WNBA players on the thinking that overseas is especially valuable for them to develop, and probably because they're not they're really not making a lot of money in the WNBA, and there's an acknowledgement that you do need to go overseas and kind of augment that a little bit. But but it's also but, good for mid tier players. I'm sorry to interrupt. Yes, you, yes. But that and that's where I'm going. Yeah. Um, so so excluding the, I'll call them rookies, even though it's rookies and second year players, but excluding the rookies from this rule, again, squeezes out the mid-tier players, just like the salary cap realities do. So now you've got these two factors working in tandem to make it really, really hard for these mid-tier players to stick in the league, even if they're better than those younger, cheaper players. And so, you know, the owners are, are pushing for prioritization um, in part, you know, if, if players don't go overseas, then they'll be more rested. Like we'll get the best product on the floor, but if you're making it so that general managers can't have the best players on their final roster because of these rules or because of salary cap constraints, you're still diluting the quality of the product. So I, I think there are a lot of unintended consequences of this and, and it's unfortunate for players um, who are just, you know, trying to trying to get a foothold in this league because it's really hard for any player to have that security. Yeah, I mean, before we move on to our final segment, there is a fabulous quote that you had in your story from uh, Erica's agent, Mike Count. It's something along the lines of, if you've got four or five years in the league and you don't stick, it's really hard. You've got a 20% chance to get back in. 20% chance. I mean, how it just makes me think of what that percentage is in the NBA. In the NBA, you have a whole other American professional league right underneath it in the G League. The and w so many more roster spots in the NBA to begin with. Like, no shade to any NBA players, but like seeing final rosters come out, I'm like, that guy's in the NBA. I don't even know who that one is. Like in the WNBA, there's like no, there's no give. Whereas in the NBA, there's, there's a lot more just space. Mm -hmm. All right. So now I'm going to take a little break, but coming up, we're going to talk about how we got here, how we got into this problem where middle tier players are getting squeezed out and why someone like Erica is dealing with the situation she is. All right, welcome back to Locked On Women's Basketball. I'm Jackie Powell. I'm here with Jen Hatfield, and we're talking about the story she wrote about sixth year pro Erica McCall. And so, Jen, we've talked about your story, how you got to writing it. We talked about why Erica McCall's story is so important and why, and what it says about the current state of the WNBA. And we came to the conclusion that what Erica's story shows us is it shows us how middle tier players are constantly being squeezed out and sort of 
forced into really uncomfortable situations in this league. So now I want to look forward thinking a bit. But also before we do, I want to say, well, and I want to ask you, how did we get here? Why are we in a position like this? And you alluded to it before. I feel like there are a lot of reasons that, that I, I mean, I could go really big picture and say sexism and like investment in women's sports. And I could talk about all that overlaying baggage. But uh, fundamentally, a lot of this results from the last WNBA CBA, which was remarkable on so many counts. They, they, it was a landmark agreement. They got so much accomplished. I can't overstate the, the growth that came out of that CBA. But the players had to compromise. And this was one of their compromises, prioritization was. Um, and, you know, even expansion wasn't really in, the, in that CBA. And so they were focusing more on, on salaries for existing players, which you can, you can debate that if you want to. Um, but, you know, it, fundamentally, there remained a limited number of roster spots. And they introduced this prioritization rule that's, that's putting the squeeze on folks. And so... You know, that's how negotiations go. There are, there are good things and bad things for each side, and they shake hands and they sign it. And then when the time comes, they, they try to do it again and, and make it better for both parties. So, uh, you know, it's, it's necessarily imperfect. It got a lot accomplished, but that's how we, how we ended up here. You're absolutely correct. And so I was thinking solution-wise. I was thinking, well, okay, so the CBA is imperfect. We know that. But how even leading up to the opt-out date, which I believe I'm trying to remember, they can opt out of it in 2025, correct? I believe so. So we've got a couple of years before we get there. But I was thinking, I was scenario planning in my head, and I actually, I will be frank, I DM'd Erica and I told her, that I listened to her episode with Carly Samuelson. And I said, listen, your chat about health insurance made me feel seen. And so we got into this discussion talking about what could be done for middle tier players. And so Jen, I'm gonna share what I think could be a potential solution down the road, but I want you to think about what is a potential solution down the road to this problem um, as well. So something I've thought about is who is actually doing the negotiating on the player's side? I've thought a lot about the WNBPA executive committee. Who are those folks? And so I have the website here, and I'm not sure, this probably is not the most up-to-date list of officers, but I just want to run through who we have on the executive committee. So NECA's the president. Leisha Clarendon is the first vice president. Shnei Agumake, vice president. Sue Bird, who is now retired. I, I wonder how her spot will be replaced, it is also on the executive committee. Satu Sabali is a vice president. Elizabeth Williams is the secretary. And Natalie Achanwa is the treasurer. And then you also see here, you see a bunch of player reps. And we don't necessarily know how much power those folks have. But let's start with the executive committee, Jen. Based on that list and people who I just read out to you, did anything stand out about the types of players that were that I just mentioned? That's a lot of very established veteran players, with the exception of Satu Sabali. Um, you know, those are some like a lot a lot of those players have all WNBA honors of some kind. That is correct. And so it's my thought that maybe the middle tier players need to be represented by the executive committee. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I'm, it's probably, you know, their spots aren't as secure and can they have a spot if, if they get cut? That, that might factor into it. But yeah, you should have input from players who are not as entrenched um, as some of these these players who maybe, you know, never, you know, were a number one overall pick and never had to worry about getting cut in their lives, which that's awesome for them, but it's not the reality for most WNBA players. So, so yeah, I think that perspective is, is really valuable. 
Um, and even I would say not just among player reps, um, I get the sense that the executive committee is the one really with the, the most uh, concentrated power in terms of negotiations. You know, obviously the, the player reps do have a say and they're communicating with their teams and all that, but the executive committee is kind of the, the sun to, to, you know, that everything orbits around as far as the player side of negotiations. Yeah. And I just think that, you know, obviously we talk about how sports are a microcosm of society, right? And so we know that if we think about in the United States, what it looks like, you don't always have, uh, or the people that are representing our country aren't always, they don't always represent the majority of the country. And so the majority of the WNBA or at least a large portion of the WNBA, are these middle-tier players. That group has its ebbs and flows, but I'd say that the amount of players that come from it each year is a pretty sizable amount. Yeah. And again, we're not we're not knocking the executive committee no. that it hurt Julian work, but we just want to help them a little bit. Yes. And so what are some potential solutions that you're thinking of? Yeah, I mean, on the topic of prioritization, um, you know, I don't know how much the WNBA coordinates with other leagues, but if there are no conflicts between overseas leagues and the WNBA, then prioritization is moot. No one's late. And so, you know, I'm not sure that's possible with every league or any league, but uh, when the WNBA is setting its schedule, can it look at those playoffs? Can it, it figure out ways to kind of mitigate that? Um, can it work with those leagues to, to figure out where to put things in the calendar so that prioritization affects fewer players? And so it's more predictable when it does happen. You know, um, if, if they're going to, for example, like the French league runs super late and, and players who play in the French league know that they might be toast um, under prioritization. Um, but, you know, in other leagues, it might be a little bit more on the bubble, depending on the season. Like that's having that sort of predictability so the player knows, yeah, I'm probably not going to make it back or, yeah, I should make it back as opposed to, I don't know, like I could, if my team is bad, I will. But if my team is good, I won't. And I, I don't have a good read on that. So just planning the schedule really thoughtfully and in consultation with other leagues, I think could could just kind of. You know, you don't need a rule change for that. You just eliminate the issue. Um, so that's one thing. I don't know how realistic that is. Um, but, you know, and then, of course, there's the CBA negotiations. I think expansion would, would solve a lot of these issues just by opening up. And that, I mean, expanding the number of teams or expanding roster spots per team would alleviate some of these issues by just having more roster spots. Obviously, the salary cap needs to expand commensurately, so it's not even tighter of a squeeze on these players, right? Um, but just having more space in the league, kind of like I mentioned with the NBA. Um, and But then that, that also doesn't solve the issue uh, that Erica dealt with as far as having no resources when she got cut. And I think that is incredibly challenging, um, but that we do need some sort of G League solution at some point. Um, whether that comes through the three on three model, I know I've, I've talked to some folks in the three on three space who, who hope that can be kind of an incubator of, of talent um, for that, whether it's athletes unlimited, um, there needs to be some sort of infrastructure. So it's not uh, WNBA or bust domestically. Yeah, I, I definitely agree on that front. When it comes to three on three, though, I've actually spoken to our Isabel Rodriguez and she spoke about how. On the outside, uh, 3x3 looks like a good incubator for the W, but it might not be because that style of play is quite different and it requires, especially on the international stage, it requires a, a different type of focus. So yes. while on the outside it seems like it's a brilliant idea, there are some logistical questions about it. Um, before we do sign off, I do want to say that some of what Jen has spoken about this episode can be connected to the previous episode of Locked On WBB that I hosted alongside Doug Feinberg, where we talked about 
how these different stakeholders in the WNBA, in FIBA, in some of the uh, national international leagues, meaning like the Turkish League and the the Hungarian League, all of those different stakeholders and shareholders have to come together. And so what, how? That's sort of what we want to know. How are they all going to come together to make sure that the athletes don't suffer? And what we saw during the World Cup is that may be starting to happen. So we want to thank you all for tuning into what has been an absolutely fascinating discussion. Um, Jen, thank you so much for coming on and giving us a little bit more behind the scenes into your your story about Erica McCall and how her story, it really matters and it's really important. So thank you for making Locked On Women's Basketball your first listen every day. And join us tomorrow where Hunter Cruz will be back for our WNBA draft themed show. And he'll be interviewing and doing a film room sesh alongside potential WNBA lottery pick, Maryland's Diamond Miller. So now make your second listen locked on NBA. Oh yes, men play pro basketball too. NBA season is here, and our local NBA experts and insiders have you covered on and off the court all season long. All your biggest stories around the NBA, Monday through Friday in less than 30 minutes. It's all available on YouTube, Odyssey, and wherever you get your daily podcasts. This has been the Locked On Women's Basketball Podcast. Have a wonderful weekend, and thank you. Are Locked On Women's Basketball, your daily podcast on women's basketball, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day.